Good evening, Southridge friends and family. Let's go ahead and enter into a time of worship before we get into the word this evening. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Let's make this declaration that our God is great. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Thank you. 
survey day, Southridge Church. What do I mean by survey day? We're going to take a survey. It's not going to be an easy survey. Uh, you're going to have to answer some tough questions. But the positive side to this survey is that you get to do it inside your head. Nobody knows what your answers are going to be, okay, except for you. So survey question number one, how is your obedience to Christ? How is your obedience to Christ? Do your behaviors reflect an obedient relationship to Christ? Now, if you're honest with yourself, you probably already thought of a couple areas that you're weak in. I'm going to ratchet it, the pressure up a little bit uh, in our survey because you don't just get to answer the questions yourself. I want you to think of another perspective. So in our survey here this evening, um, I want you to think about how the people closest to you would answer that question. How would your spouse answer your question? What would your spouse have to say about your behaviors? and your obedience to Christ? What about your kids? What would they have to say? If you're single or you're younger, what, what would your parents say about your behaviors? Your coworkers, your boss, your employees, other Christians in the church? Tonight we're going to get into some real life application. A lot of times you hear people complain, well, that was a good sermon, but there wasn't any life application. What can I take from it? Well, you're going to get plenty tonight. We're going to finish up the Rooted series, and as you may have imagined, uh, my night is entitled Rooted in Obedience Through Christ and Our Behavior. We're going to be finishing up in the book of Colossians. And you probably already realize my bottom line, and I'm going, to be, I'm going to be hammering you with it all through this sermon, is how is your obedience? How is your obedience? Let's go to the word. It's, uh, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, and we're going to go through chapter 4, verse 6. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants or slaves. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as, the Lord, <coughs> as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven? Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer this evening, and as we look at this passage of scripture that Paul has written to the Colossians, Lord, may we see the parallels with our daily life and know the word that your word is a living word and it applies 
just as in Paul's day as it does now. Help us, Lord, to be obedient even when it's hard. Even when it's challenging. Help us to wrestle with your word. Help us to wrestle with the application. And help us to be obedient. Lord, open your word up to us. Open our hearts. Help us to receive it. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, last week, Megan was in chapter 3, and she was talking about taking off the old clothes, putting the new clothes on. And so, when we become Christians, when we come to faith in Christ, we are a new person. The moment you come to faith in Christ, you're a new person. And as you put your faith and your belief in Christ, there's some things that come along with that. Because it's easy to say, well, I believe. But does your obedience, do your behaviors reflect your belief? Because here's the thing. When I say I believe in something, that's going to change my behavior. Okay, if I thought for a known fact, that I was going to have like a king or queen show up at my house tomorrow evening. I would be working to clean things up. I would be getting ready for whoever the dignitary was that was going to come to my house. If I believed for a fact that they were coming. So when I say I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, I believe that he saved my soul, that's going to affect the way I live my life. That is going to affect my behaviors. And the Apostle Paul knew this, and he writes about this continually in the letters that he wrote in the New Testament. So we take off the old clothes, and just to kind of give us a reminder, back in chapter 3, it talks about the character of the new man. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now I know I read that pretty fast, and if you go back and, and study through that, that Paul's saying a lot right there. That's a lot of new clothes to put on. And some of those things are going to be a lot easier for us as individuals to, to put on. And some of those things are going to be really difficult. But we are called to work on those things, to put on those new clothes. And what we're getting ready to talk about, as you heard from the scripture we read, it's going to require all those things. Humility, grace, meekness, thanksgiving. It's going to require all those new clothes to be successful in being obedient to Christ. And so often, what we get in the church is lip service. On Sundays, we're doing good with this. Maybe on Wednesday evenings, if we make it to church, we're doing good with this. And that's it. We struggle with it for the rest of the week. And we just give these things lip service. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to be obedient in action and behavior. So lip service isn't going to cut it. We have to go to work. And when I say we have to go to work, these things require work. You're not going to be perfect in these on day one. You're not going to stand up from an altar call where you've just given your life to Christ or wherever you've given your life to Christ. It could be in a car, at your house, or wherever. But you're not going to stand up and be perfect in these things that, uh, that God has called us to be obedient in. It's going to require work. Now, as sort of a pre-note to what we're getting ready to talk about, one of the key characteristics is submission. We submit to Christ 
we submit to one another. And so as a, as a pre-note here before we get into any other discussion, I want everybody to understand that in human relationships, when one person is abusing another, that's never okay. And so when we talk about relationships submitting to one another, don't think for a second that God wants you to stay in a relationship where you're being physically, emotionally, or whatever abused. That's not the case. Okay? So, throw that little caveat out there. For those of you who are taking notes, uh, like I said, the Apostle Paul talks about this almost in all his letters. Uh, Peter also talks about this, uh, this same line of being obedient. If you want to further study, I'm not going to go back into another book of the Bible tonight, but if you want further study, there is a very good parallel passage to what we're talking about tonight in Colossians, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, starting with verse 19, and it goes through chapter 6, verse 9. It says the same thing, it goes into a little bit more detail, so if you're curious about what anything I say tonight uh, search through the scriptures in Colossians, go to Ephesians and read that book, um, and it'll, it probably will help to clear, clarify some, some things. So, let's go back to the Word, and we're going to walk through this passage verse by verse and see what it says for us. Verse 18 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So when we look at this, that word submit comes from a Greek word that means to subject oneself. To subject oneself. Now, when you are subjecting yourself, that means you are willingly putting yourself under the authority of of a person or a thing. Now, the wording is very important here. And I want, you to, I want you to hear it and I want you to know what it's saying. Willingly putting yourself under the submission. So what that means is that it is not the husbands to command. Husbands, your, your wife's submission, that is not for you to command from her. That is hers to give to you willingly and lovingly. Wives, speaking from a husband's perspective, I know it can be hard to submit to your husband sometimes, especially when we're wrong. Here's the thing you got to understand. Your supreme submission, the reason you do submit to your husband, as a Christian wife, is because your supreme submission is to Christ. And Christ, in his word, has commanded this structure in the family. So as Christ is head of the church, so is the husband the head of the family. So it is your Christian duty to submit to your husbands. Like I said, submit, submission, subjection of oneself is willingly putting yourself under the authority of your husband. Some of these may be a hard pill to swallow for some of you. Not just this one, but the ones we're going to get to later. And here's, here's the stickler for the wives out there. You are called to be obedient in this command regardless of your husband's worthiness. <laughs> That's hard. And you're going to hear me say a word tonight over and over and over again. It's called unqualified. Your husband may be unqualified. He may not be a very good leader spiritually for your family. But your godly duty is to submit to his authority in a willingly and loving manner. That's, that's hard. I know I'm preaching a hard, a hard word, and it's going to get harder. This, this one, I think, is one of the easier ones. 
Let me read that verse again, and I want to pull out another word that just, it, well, as I was studying the scripture, it just jumped off the page at me. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Own, your own husband, your personal possession. We know from the scriptures that when a couple, when a man and a woman get married, two become one. So he is just as much your possession as you are his possession. So the perspective on submitting to that, putting yourself subject to his authority, to me that makes it so much easier when you think of it from the per perspective that you are submitting to the man that you possess as your own. That's your man that you are submitting to. So how's your obedience? Personal inventory night. Not, not condemning anyone, but be honest with yourself. How's your obedience? Let's go to verse 19 because I have a feeling some husbands have been elbowing. You shouldn't have done that. Trust me. Verse 19. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Let me read that again. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. This love that is mentioned here in verse 19, it is the highest level of love that you can attain. It is Christ's love for the church. It is a selfless love. It means, husbands, you should be willing to die for your wife because there was nothing less that Christ gave to the church. That is a high calling. That is what I call a high standard. That is what I call, as I was studying this word, me going down to the kitchen where my wife was doing some work and asking for forgiveness. Because I can't even begin to imagine how many times I've fallen short of that standard. The husband is to be the head of the family as Christ is head of the church. Now, when we go back and we, we think back to that submission part that is the wives' duty. And we talked about how wives have to submit even if the husband's unqualified. Husbands, you are to love, even if you feel like your wife is unqualified to receive that love. You are to be the head of the household as Christ is head of the church. And is there any doubt from anybody in here how much Christ loves the church? So there shouldn't be any doubt from outsiders or from your closest family members or your friends how much you love your wife. If we were to complete that survey that we talked about at the beginning of the service, how many of your friends would say, oh man, he, he is in love with his wife. He takes such good care of her. He puts her first. He always respects her. Never a, never a, a bad word about her. How's your obedience? That word bitter that shows up in verse 19, it could be translated as stop being bitter. In the present form. Don't make it a habit of being harsh and angrily resentful towards your wife. As Christ loved the church, so you are to love your wife. The thing I find is, if both parties are first submitted to Christ and then submitted to one another, this typically goes pretty smoothly. My wife, every time uh, we've heard this sermon or this scripture preached, she'll, she'll make the comment, well, I don't know a woman alive that would care to submit to her husband if he held up that end of the bargain. And she's right. And where this usually goes wrong, where this usually goes poorly in the marriage relationship is where if one person becomes or allow selfishness to enter in. I can look at my personal life and where I've messed up 
I've put my needs and my wants and my concerns above my wife's and fallen short of that standard. Because if I was living up to that standard that Christ set here and gave to the Apostle Paul to put it to, in the letter to the Colossians, if I lived up to that standard, there would never be a moment where my needs superseded hers. So how is your obedience, husbands? How are you doing with verse 19? I told you this was going to be tough. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. If you go back into the book of Ephesians where Paul is writing the same, the same commands to the Ephesians, he discusses this one in a little bit more detail. And he says, children, this is the, the first commandment with a promise. If you are obedient in this to your parents in all areas, it's the first commandment with promise that says it will go well with you and your days will be long on the earth. Something to think about. And once again, I'll throw that unqualified word out there. Kids, students, you may not think that your parents are deserving of your obedience. That's not what it says. It doesn't say listen to your parents when you agree with them. It says listen to your parents in all, all things, at all times. The only exception to that rule is when you are asked to do something that's contrary to God's word. Verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. That word provoke means stir up or to irritate or to have unrealistic expectations. And in some commentaries it'll say, it uses the word fathers and generally speaking, it, it's talking to the fathers, but it could also mean parents. Don't provoke, stir up, irritate your children. Lest they become discouraged. How easy is it for us to screw that up as parents? How many times have I done that to my kids? Where I thought they should be doing something differently, and I was a little bit too harsh on them. Paul is speaking to a society, a Jewish society at the time, where the dads ruled with an iron fist. And the cares and the concerns of the wife and the kids are, were normally a secondary concern, if it reached the secondary level. And I can't help but thinking, a lot of times in our society, we as parents, we will put what we want for our kids and our expectations for our kids over our kids' heads to the point where it's detrimental to their growth. How is your obedience? Starting with verse 22 and moving through chapter 4, verse 1, Paul starts talking about the relationship between bond servants and their masters. Slave and master. Now, before we get into the scripture, understand this, that the Bible never condones slavery. In fact, there's several different areas in the Bible where it speaks against the conditions of slavery. But as Paul is writing to the Colossians, he understands that it is a part of society. And as part of the society, he knows people are living in that condition. And so he, what his desire is, is for anybody in any condition in society to reflect the love of God, to be obedient to Christ, because your obedience, your obedience has a strong message, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. There's a, there's a reason, there's a purpose to your obedience. Even when it seems unfair in a condition like master and slave, Remember that unqualified word. The modern parallel, if you want to take away some real life application, is employee, employer. So 
Let's look at it from that perspective. Slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. How many of us know somebody from the job site who only works hard, only does what they're supposed to do when they know somebody's watching? And the second that uh, the boss or the supervisor turns their back or walks away, they're right back kicking their feet up, not doing a thing. I cannot begin to tell you how many times I have seen that happen with Christians and how detrimental that was to their witness. I'm not ever going to mention any names, but I have worked with people who profess to be Christians. I had a supervisor one time who professed to be a Christian, and it was a job that was hard, and, and his help would have been very beneficial to the work crew. And he, after he would witness to people and tell them how big of a Christian he was, he would go back to his work spot and sleep. And I, I can't even begin to tell you how many people he turned off from church because of that behavior. And don't think for a second that God doesn't care about your work. He has put you where you are to be a light and to be a witness. And your work quality matters. And let me show you why. Verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. When you are at work, at your job, whatever your job is, it doesn't matter what it is. Notice, it doesn't say, well, if you're in full-time ministry, work as if you're working for, no, it doesn't say that. It says, work as if you're working for the Lord, because you are. If you're a Christian, if you identify as Christian, this is one of the biggest behavior modifiers. You're not working for your boss anymore. You're not working for the company anymore. You're working for Christ. So each day, you should be able to get into your car for the commute home and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with what I gave Christ today. That's a high standard. It's very hard when you have a boss or a company that you don't care much for. And the boss isn't being fair. And maybe you're busting your butt and you're doing all the work and everybody else gets the rewards. Notice the unqualified word comes up. It doesn't matter if your boss is qualified to receive your respect. You're working for Christ. You've got to keep focused on, on the scripture on this one. You have to understand that your reward isn't on this earth. And the, the word promises you here that you will receive the reward of your inheritance. God sees what you're doing. Don't worry about if you're going to get compensated or not. And I know that's unpopular. I'm a middle school teacher. And when you do this, when you take on this mindset, you're going to be accused of being a goody-goody. You're going to be accused of being the, the boss's uh, pet. Who cares? I don't work for my boss. He might have something to say about that, but I'll tell him, I don't work for you, I work for Christ. The quality of my work is my witness. How is your obedience? And if you're sitting in here and you're a boss, and you're like, yeah, I wish my employees would hear this. Make sure you understand that you're not off the hook either. Chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. If you're a boss, if you're a supervisor, and you identify as a Christian, and you tell people you're a Christian, and you're not just and fair with your employees, what do you think message that sends? What's the world seeing out of a supervisor that isn't fair or just? Your Savior is fair and just, so you should be too. 
moving on and wrapping up here in chapter 4. And I, I told you earlier that we would be talking about why is it so important to be obedient in these areas? Why is it so important to, to struggle in this and, and work hard at this and, and get better and grow in this? Starting with verse 2, Paul reminds the Colossians to continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. It doesn't escape me that every time I'm preparing a sermon with real life application, it always comes back to prayer. If you want to be a good wife to your husband, pray. Keep the lines of communication open between you and God and you and your husband. Communication. Husbands, if you want to be a good husband, if you want to be the loving husband that Christ calls you to be, pray. Keep the lines of communication open between you and God. Every one of these characteristics, every one of these positions, spouse, kids, employee, employer, if you want to be good at it, pray. It's not always going to be easy. You know that. If you're married, you know that marriage isn't always easy. You know that if you're working, that your relationship with your coworkers and your boss isn't always easy. But we are called to a higher calling as Christians. How is our obedience? You better make sure that you're praying. Verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Think about how much more of an impact you will have in your personal ministry to the lost if you don't even really have to speak that much. That the lost can look at you and your life, see how much you respect and love your spouse, see how well you treat your children. When you're at work, you're always the hardest working. You always have a positive attitude. Because let me tell you something, if you identify as a Christian, you better believe there are people watching you very closely. They are waiting for you to slip up. They're waiting to see a little crack in your defense. And as verse 5 says, and I like this phrase, redeeming the time. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. It's going to be a lot easier for you to be a witness to somebody when an opportunity arises, when they know you live an obedient lifestyle, and there's the importance. If you show up at work every day, and you halfway do your job, and you talk bad about the boss behind their back, and then an opportunity arises to invite a coworker to church or to witness to him. It's not going to have nearly the impact it would have if that coworker saw you living an obedient lifestyle to Christ. Verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Here's another tricky, tricky saying here. Let your speech always be with grace. You received grace, so you should be gracious. Yet seasoned with salt. So what was the purpose of salt? It was to season food, right? But it was also used as a purifier. You're always to speak in grace. But if, you, if you're living an obedient lifestyle, and people see that day in and day out, you're living the obedient lifestyle that Paul calls the Colossians to live. 
your words are going to have so much more impact. And when you are gracious with your words and you season them with salt and, and the opportunities that arise when you get to witness to somebody and you, you can be gentle with them and you can be loving and your, your words are seasoned with salt, it makes it that much more impactful. But listen, salt is also purifying. And if you are living an obedient lifestyle and there comes this opportunity to witness to a person and your words have to be a little bit more harsh, it gives your words credibility. It gives your words power because they know that you're obedient to the word of God, you're living an obedient lifestyle to Christ. Where the opposite wouldn't be true, they will most likely be offended and get angry and storm off if you were seasoning your words with a little bit of that purifying salt. Because sometimes, and especially in our society, everybody's so easily offended anymore. And for some reason, there's this misconception that you can't be a little bit harsh and loving. Yeah, I, I can be harsh and loving. Let me give you an example. If your house was on fire and you were just sitting on your couch, I would break through your door and grab you by the shirt collar and jerk you out and say, come on, you got to get out of the house. You might be offended, but it's going to save your life. And I venture to say if I saved your life and had to be a little bit harsh, you would still call me loving because I didn't let you just sit on that couch and burn up. These aren't easy sayings. We can read through this really quick and be like, okay, I got to love my wife and love my family, treat my kids good, work hard. But when we try to actually apply this to our life, let me tell you something, it's going to be a struggle. And you're going to require the help of Christ every single day. As Megan said last week, you don't just put, take off the old clothes and put the new clothes on once. You do it every single day consistency. Every day you wake up, I'm going to be obedient to Christ. So how is your obedience? Are you obedient to Christ only when you feel like the others are qualified to receive it? Or are you obedient regardless of the situation? Tough word. Let's go, to the word in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you're listening to this video tonight, wherever you're at, and you understand that, man, I, I need work, you're in a great place. Because all you got to do is pray and ask God, and you can start that journey today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, that your word isn't always easy. That sometimes we are challenged and it's difficult. But through that challenge and that difficulty, God, we grow stronger and we grow closer to you. Help us, Lord, not to be self-righteous, but to, be, uh, to look at ourselves tonight in a, with a very critical eye. Help us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you. Where we need guidance and direction, we ask for it. We ask, Lord, that you show us how to be obedient. Where we're struggling in areas, I pray, God, that if there's somebody struggling in one of the specific areas we've discussed tonight, Lord, that they wouldn't just reach out for help from you, but, Lord, they would reach out to other brothers and sisters in Christ because we're better together. I just pray, God, that you be with each and every member of this church. Help us as we go out into the world that we're not just giving lip service to these things, but we're making a, a daily effort to be obedient to your word and to live an obedient lifestyle to you, Jesus, through our behaviors. God, give us guidance, give us direction, give us strength, and help us, Lord, to live each day for you. In your holy name, 